All right, looks like we've reached quorum, so let's dig in. Uh, welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you're calling in from. You are in the Inflation and Recession Resilient Alternative Assets discussion. We've got a really insightful discussion for you here today. My name is Eric Cantor. I'm the moderator of this discussion. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Vincent. Vincent is the first digital asset manager for alternative assets. We help investors build portfolios of assets, including venture, art, collectibles, private credit, real estate, crypto, and more. You can find us at www.withvincent.com. We've got a really engaging discussion today. Three partners from some of those asset classes are here to talk through their approach and their uh, constructive feedback on today's market. Uh, they all offer assets that at some level are recession resilient and inflation resistant. And I know a lot of people have interest in, in learning more about that. Uh, the, the schedule for this discussion is we're going to do uh, short intros, then we're going to jump into a number of questions that have been submitted beforehand, discuss those, uh, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. Uh, a quick disclosure before we start, this call is not meant in any way to be investment advice. It's a discussion to educate, engage, and hopefully to entertain. Relatedly, past performance of any asset is not predictive of future results. So keep that in mind. So we're going to do quick intros, we're going to get into the discussion, and then we'll open it up to, to you. But at any point, please feel free, if anything's on your mind, to drop questions in the Q&A. Uh, so for our introductions, why don't we start with Nelson Shu, the founder and CEO of Percent. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. Great to meet everyone. Thank you all for joining today. My name is Nelson Chu, founder and CEO of Percent. Uh, we've created an alternative investment platform specifically focused on private credit. And so private credit uh, is split into almost like two types of assets and investments that you can make. Uh, one is considered ABS or asset back, and that's going to be essentially investing in the portfolio of loans um, that are packaged together across small business lending and consumer lending and things like that. And there's also corporate debt. Uh, and so that is more conventional uh, investments into single companies uh, where you're essentially investing on the uh, based on the performance of the company itself, uh, whether they're cash flow positive or they're upside for the future. Uh, so we offer both those types of investments on percent and looking forward to sharing more about our perspective on inflation and everything like that. Thanks, Nelson. Uh, now let's go to Anthony Zhang, co-founder and CEO at Vinavest. Thanks, Eric. And hey, everybody. Good to see everybody. I am one of the co-founders and CEO of Vinovest. We are an investment platform for wine and whiskey. Um, so we help folks be able to invest in diversified portfolios and directly own appreciating bottles as well as casks of rare wine and whiskey. Really excited to be amongst many other talented founders and excited for this discussion. Thank you. Great. Uh, last but not least, uh, let's introduce Brian Daly, the co-founder and CEO at Ground Floor. Uh, sure. Uh we started Ground Floor 10 years ago because we saw that retail investors would show up in alternatives in a big way. We felt that residential real estate was a natural fit uh, because it's a tangible asset class uh, that is uh, inflation resistant in many ways. The product we offer today is a fractionalized uh, debt security that allows you to participate in real estate investment loans. Uh, we've recently expanded into also uh, offering real estate equity, uh, equity in those properties. Uh, so there's an opportunity to participate in all parts of the capital stack right alongside experienced real estate investors who are buying property to fix and flip or they're doing new construction or building a rental portfolio. So great to be with you guys today uh, and looking forward to the discussion. Great. So we've got a nice mix of alternative asset classes here that we're going to be talking through. Uh, let's start with a with a brief overview of where this market is at right now today. We're in a fairly unique moment here. I think everybody would agree. Um, rates approaching you know multi decade highs. Uh, the first time many investors have seen this type of environment. I think just yesterday we heard about the latest uh, twenty five basis point increase. So that's affecting all of our assets. At the same time, inflation has been a big issue. We we spoke about that on our last discussion with a few of these panelists. That seems to be going back to quote unquote normal, although we haven't seen it get all the way there. So, so that's still a question. Um, all this combined and, and some other factors going on, I'm, I'm sure everyone's up to date on the banking crisis, which evolves after we made these slides. 
So we might want to hone in on that in our discussion a bit. Um, but there's a lot of fear of recession. The yield curve reflects that. Um, and that's why we're here to talk about assets that might help get you through this next period. Uh, last, you know, the, the overall market, which includes each of the assets we're going to be talking about, is reflecting that in some way, some level of uncertainty. Um, some things have held up pretty well. Some things have properties that are that, that get you around some of the challenges of inflation. So we're, we're going to dig into you know what that looks like right now. But just to set this context, let's keep that in mind as as we jump into our conversation. So why don't we start with um, you know an overall question for each panelist? Uh, what's your take on today's investing climate? How do you and the investors that you're working with navigate everything going on in the market? Why don't we start with Nelson? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, more so than ever, uh, diversification is the name of the game here to be able to actually hedge yourself against everything going on. Uh, I think the obviously many people have been talking about the fact that the 60-40 is dead. I think the reality is, with as you can tell from all the panelists on this call today, uh, there is no and never been easier way to diversify across various different asset classes. And that is ultimately the best way to protect yourself. Um, the, the traditional asset classes, I think, that have always held up well um, have been and will continue to be solid. Uh, but alternatives should be probably a decent part of the portfolio because they oftentimes are uncorrelated, right? And so in times like this, when inflation is or was running rampant and you have the Fed raising rates, you have to look for opportunities that are going to help you outpace inflation uh, because obviously, you know, the risk-free rate, while it feels good uh, with the treasuries and the bank accounts and all of that yielding quite decently relative to what it was before, uh, that all is fine. But looking at those numbers that you just pulled up, it's not beating inflation, right? So you have to find other ways to get that alpha. And oftentimes that is going to come from alternative investments like uh, some of the asset classes you see here today. So diversification into various different things uh, is the name of the game. And trying to get that little bit of alpha uh, versus the risk-free rate is going to be critical, impor critically important to help uh, protect the portfolio against what may come in the coming years. Good overview. Why don't we uh, turn to Brian? Same question. How are you navigating today's environment? Well, the environment today, I mean, there are obviously a lot of headlines about uh, the housing market. Uh, there are a lot of headlines about banks, uh, and we sit at the intersection of that. I mean, one way to understand ground floor is, is we allow you to be the bank. Uh, instead of turning over your deposits to a bank that then is going to go lend those deposits out, our platform allows you to be the lender and for you to get the benefit of that, the full benefit of it, the full yield of it. For us in this environment, uh, we're actually really pleased to be a debt investor. Uh, there are a lot of platforms out there that are allowing retail investors to take equity exposure uh, in rental houses, for example. Uh, you know, With all the house price appreciation, it is probably equity investors who are going to be first to be crushed and have been crushed in any house price appreciation decline. And one of the great virtues of being a debt investor is that when you're the bank, you're the first to be paid. And that's not common for uh, for investors, especially retail investors, to get the benefit of that. Uh, and I think for us in this environment, we're seeing huge inflows of capital because, you know, when we were delivering 10% annualized returns during the run-up in house prices, that looked small. I mean, it looked small relative to a meme stock or a cryptocurrency, but on the way down, that 10% is still 10%. And in fact, now we're writing credit for 12% because as rates have increased, we passed along a lot of those rate increases to the investor. Uh, and we haven't, we don't take any cut out of that return. So you benefit just like the bank would. And I think, so this environment actually plays to our strengths uh, in real estate and where we are in the capital stack and in the segment of real estate that we're in. So we're, we're growing a lot. And I think people are realizing that it's good to be the bank. Uh, turn to Anthony. What are you seeing out there in the market or down there in the barrel cask room, <laughs> wherever you're sitting? Well, Brian made a really good point. Um, you know, our, our asset class, wine and whiskey, it's it's low double digit percentages. So when there was a run up with crypto and S and P and meme stocks, right, uh, our our returns were relatively safe and boring. And now, when everything else is down so violently, um, those returns look pretty good, right? And I think searching a lot of our clients and investors are searching for that rare piece of stability in their portfolio and i think you can find a lot of that with diversification uh, vacation into many of these asset classes 
Um, for wine and whiskey, uh, much of the assets that we deal with are considered luxury goods, and luxury goods are uh, traditionally uh, more recession resistant than others, um, more recession than the uh, ultra premiums or premium products as well. And another thing is that a lot of the prices in our market are driven by consumption and uh, probably to the detriment of society, uh, consumption of alcohol goes up during recessions <laughs> and, and when the stock market goes down. So uh, we've been seeing some nice inflows as well recently. My consumption has definitely gone up as well. I'll, I'll, yeah, uh, I was sure. thinking that, but not going to say it. Yeah, um, you, so yes. Maybe double clicking on something, something else and said, so inflation is in this transient phase and, and a lot of people are misunderstand inflation, its impact. A lot of people have asked, hey, uh, yeah, it's nice that the numbers are going up on my private credit stuff, especially, but is it real? Isn't it being you know eaten away by, by inflation? So what does your asset class do to help position somebody you know, relative to inflation? Uh, why don't we start with Nelson since you, you raised that point? Yeah, for sure. I think um, private credit, because of the inherent nature of the structure of the product, uh, it is always going to be almost like a real-time gut check on the Fed, the macro environment, and the markets as a whole, right? So uh, it's not exactly floating rate per se, but just by nature of the fact that durations are a lot shorter, you're going to see how investors are reacting to it. And on a platform like Percent, where you actually, or we give investors the power to actually dictate uh, the pricing of things, they can actually have a say in sort of where they think the products should be priced based on the risk that they're taking in that regard, right? So we're seeing this all the time. We saw this during COVID. For example, like SMB lending, very challenged during COVID, right? And so what once was, you know, 10 to 11% returns spiked about 18, 19% returns over the course of nine months. And that's just by virtue of the fact that you got to get paid for that risk that you're taking, right? Uh, and now we're seeing the same thing as well. And so what was originally 12 is now 15%. What is now 15? UC15 is now 18%. Um, so the ability for private credit to basically consistently react to the market and uh, adapt to the new version of the risk-free rate is really what makes it a compelling asset class and one that can help you um, outperform uh, inflation and other assets that may be out there today. Great. Anthony, uh, what's your take on inflation? Um, with wine and whiskey, uh, because it is a physical product, right? You need uh, labor, you need gas to be able to tend to the vineyards and the distilleries. You need uh, shipping costs, right? All of that is really built into inflation as well. So I think similar to, to Nelson's asset class, but in a different way, um, those price increases are also built in. Um, and we, we saw that during COVID as well, right? With the whole world supply chain coming to a gridlock. Uh, definitely resulted in higher wine prices uh, for the bottles, for the shipping, and for a lot of those base costs that need to be built into the increasing price of wine when they release new vintages or library vintages as well. Brian? In our case, you know, the um, there are actually a few dynamics that are worth noting. I mentioned before that we started writing coupons at a higher rate as rates increased. Uh, and we didn't choose to keep pace with the risk-free rate. Uh, we actually you know, grew, the, grew the rates a little slower because we're actually seeing so much demand for this credit that we want to make sure that we have enough supply. Uh, and I'll, I'll say that on the back end, uh, in these inflationary times, you see it's really the equity holders, and those could be our borrowers, those could be people who are investing in equity fractionally. They're the people who get squeezed. And the, the way that we deal with that on the back end is if a loan is late, we start charging default interest. And so not only, as Nelson pointed out, in private credit, do you benefit from sort of short tenor, right, or short durations? You know, we write most of our credit is a 12-month loan that typically repays in about 12 to 10 to 12 months. But if it goes past that 12-month point, we start charging default interest. And so you'll find on important parts of your portfolio, you're actually earning 14% interest or even on a loan that was written last year at 10%, that would be 12% now. If it's late, you start earning 12%. So you, you start to really see the benefits in all of these seasons because private credit can be so responsive. And another example I'll make is we, we sell these short-term notes that are one, you can lend money to us for one month, three months, or 12 months, 24 months. And that's backed by a pool of real estate credit. You know, we move those rates up as demand, you know, increases for that capital. 
And, you know, we've edged those rates up. So there are a lot of different ways for investors to play rates as inflation and protect themselves from inflation. And I think private credit has some built in, you know, protections to that, that are pretty handy. And it, again, as an equity investor, you know, you don't benefit from those because your hold period's longer and you buy at a certain cap rate and then you're holding out and hoping that prices increase and don't decrease later. And you just sleep a lot better as a debt investor in the end. Interesting. Um, so we promised recession and inflation. We, we covered inflation a little bit. So let, let's finish our commit here before we dive into some of these other areas. Um, so inverted yield curve, continued dislocation in a number of sectors. Now the banking crisis, a lot of people are foreseeing a very difficult uh, time in 2023, maybe 24. Um, what's your view on that? And, and how are your assets set up to, to weather that? Why don't we reverse thread and start with Brian? Sure. The recession is when our borrowers tend to make the most money if they can tap capital. So think about it. If you're a professional real estate investor and you're looking to acquire properties, when do you want to buy? When house prices are mooning, you know, or when, uh, you know, house prices are cratering. And, and during recessions is when we really see house price appreciation start to let off because unemployment starts to, starts to grow, right? The Fed, I think yesterday forecasted, uh, what they say, 4.6% uh, unemployment or 4.5% by the end of the year. You know, from where we are today at 3.6%, that's that's a, a big number of jobs uh, on a net basis that are, and if you think about the gross basis, that's a lot of dislocation in the market that probably will have an impact on house price appreciation. Um, so that, that recession, as and when it comes, I mean, nobody hopes for a recession, but again, within private credit, especially in real estate credit, there's a silver lining because the borrowers are more active and buying for better prices, which means the loans are better margined, which means they can afford to pay higher rates. And I think it inures to the benefit, creates even more safety and stability for investors in that asset class. So I think, you know, recession probably is coming. We're ready for it. Uh, our borrowers are ready for it. A lot of them are stacking up capital, waiting for it. Um, and so for us, it looks opportunistic as a platform. Thank you. Anthony made a comment earlier about... Uh... How much we're going to drink if things do go south? Uh, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? What's the impact of, of potential recession or headwinds on, on your asset class? Yeah, so our team did some analysis during the last recession of you know 08, 09. and what we saw was you know really the the main holders of these luxury assets, right? They're pretty well insulated from the recessions, um, and wine is pretty long term in that, um, for example, if you're an investor looking to mature wine, you're waiting to drink it in 10 years, and a recession hits in year three to year five, right? Um, your, your outlook is so long that you're willing to ride that out, and you're not looking to drink or liquidate that wine early, which is why we see um, the, the impact of a recession be pretty minimal in this asset class um, in the last time. Now, I, I don't know if that's going to rhyme or repeat in the future. Don't have a crystal ball, but our team feels very confident in that expected duration, that expected time to drink window, because uh, that's kind of like our, our built-in maturity dates, even though there's no, you know, there's no hard, hard and fast line there. Like that time to drink. Definitely gonna use that. Uh, Nelson, uh, what's your what's your thought here? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that private credit uh, actually emerged coming out of the global financial crisis of 0809, right? And so it's been a little bit battle tested at this point, um, and it weathered the storm of COVID extremely well, and now it's doing the same here today. Uh, without a doubt, there is most certainly a flight to quality, like that is definitely happening. Uh, but the good news is, you know, the way that the rates have increased have actually washed away uh, the ones who have been capitalizing on this kind of high flying, low rate environment but never built these sustainable businesses coming out of that, right? So there are diamonds in the rough for sure um, that you're gonna be able to find across all these various different platforms. And on top of that, you've seen this with the SCB fallout that happened a couple of weeks back. Um, there is now a situation where, you know, a lot of these assets are being sold at a discount, even though they're performing, right? And so you have the opportunity to get exposure to that type of investment at call it 80 cents on the dollar when there was nothing wrong with the loan itself. And so the opportunity to kind of capitalize on this uh, when the market seems like it's in distress or will be in distress uh, is prime for private credit to be able to shine. And we're fairly optimistic about what that means, especially since there is so much capital still sitting on the sidelines. 
there's almost like a um, it's it's almost like dangerous to be sitting on the sidelines uh, because of the fact that everyone else with that much uninvested capital needs to be able to put it to work. And so you're going to be following along with those tailwinds from the institutional investors who are looking to deploy, and you'll be able to get the benefit of this as well as an investor, as a retail investor. Great. Well, let's shift a bit from macro to micro. There's a couple hundred investors on this call. They've all got questions about, you know, great. What, what does that mean for me and my portfolio? So when you talk about general approaches that people bring to investing on your platforms, some people like your asset class generally, but may struggle to decide which assets they actually want to invest in. So I love wine, but I don't know if I should be in the Burgundy or the Pinot Noir or some combination or some spirits. Um, so let's talk about investor behavior in terms of stock picking versus managing a portfolio and, and just maybe going through what you offer. And if I was an investor that said, yeah, I want, I want to play, but I don't really know which ones to pick. What would you say to me? Uh, why don't we start with Anthony on that one? Yeah, so our platform offers both the self-directed, you know, stock picking uh, option for both our wine and whiskey products. So that means that uh, if you wanted to invest in a barrel of bourbon, you can do that. If you wanted to invest in a cask of scotch, you can do that. Um, if, um, say, hey, you're like, I just want to get exposure into whiskey. I don't really care. You create the right portfolio mix for me that comes into our managed product. So we do that on both the wine and the whiskey side so that you can get not only diversified exposure into an asset class, but diversification within that asset class. So Eric, you made up a good point in that on the wine side, for example, maybe you'd have a 20% allocation to Burgundy, 30% to Bordeaux, 20% to Tuscany, 30% to Napa, right? And then you'd be able to have exposure not only into different wines, but different wines from different regions and also different vintages. So that allows us to be able to stack an investor's portfolio for different bottles of different wines that are also set to mature at different times. So you can realize distributions earlier on along the way of a, of a potentially much more long-term journey. Got it. Nelson? I'd, say, I'd say most of our customers, they start with the managed option because they, they really uh, are new to the space and, and don't really know where to start. Awesome. Nelson, what's your thought here? Yeah, I think the best thing that we can do as a platform is always to offer optionality. And so that means that to Anthony's point as well, uh, investing directly or investing through a managed product, uh, we do offer both of them. Uh, but we go beyond, I think, um, just you know, a singular segment of the market. Uh, we provide diversification across um, different asset classes within private credit. So it could be obviously the asset back side for that portfolio of loan approach or the corporate debt side, which is single company risk uh, or exposure. And then within that, you have things like small business lending, for loans, and factor receivables, litigation finance. And so really it comes down to as an investor, um, do you have a thesis around certain things? And we saw that during COVID specifically, right? Uh, so during that time frame, small business lending, like we were talking about, for the investors who want to take that risk, who believes in the future of America of small business, they went in on that. They just got paid a lot more for that. There was a lot of demand for e-commerce financing because everyone was stuck at home. And so e-com was crazy, right? And so it totally blew up. And there was a lot of demand for that. So we give investors the opportunity to be able to pick and choose and have a thesis and test that thesis, right? If you believe that, for example, Latin America is going to be up and coming, and that's going to be a great place to be able to generate outsized returns, then by all means, we have that opportunity for you. What we've seen from a general behavior standpoint is that because our durations are so short and the minimums are so low, investors tend to actually start direct and just kind of scatter it around a little bit, $500, $1,000 each time, just to be able to test it out and see how it goes. And then when all is said and done, uh, they ultimately end up graduating to one of our managed products, which gives them exposure based on certain theses. So we have like high yield only, we have senior positions only, we have US only. Uh, and so giving them that optionality is probably the best thing we can do. And our job is to be able to provide as much disclosure as possible so they're comfortable with the investment and then ultimately uh, finding a product that meets their objectives either directly or at a managed level. Thank you. Brian, what's your take on stock picking versus managed? I want to pick up on what Nelson said there, because I think he said it very well, you know, allowing people the agency to choose their own strategy uh, is very important. Uh, at Ground Floor, we don't think the world needs another REIT. Uh, there are plenty of REITs out there. And even the largest REIT in the world over at Blackstone uh, has paused redemptions. And when you turn your money over to a fund manager, 
it's a rational choice because it's easy, you know, kind of set it and forget it. The problem comes when liquidity is crunched or the fund's liquidity is crunched uh, and you can't get your capital back. Now, if you told me that I could invest in the stock market, but I had to invest via your fund, uh, you'd say you're crazy. I want to invest in Tesla or, you know, Facebook or Microsoft or, you know, whatever stock I want. And the problem, right, with investing individually is, yeah, people don't necessarily feel confident. There's an information economics problem where, you know, our minimum investment is $10, right? That's specifically dimensioned, not because we think people are only going to invest $10 on the platform. It's so that people can invest in, a, have a portfolio of a hundred loans, like a hedge fund or a bank would have, right? Or a thousand loans. And what we find is if you provide the tools uh, for retail investors to do that and to make their own choices, They'll do it and they can do it in, an, in a way that's efficient for the information economics. Now, we also offer these notes that you don't have to pick and choose loans and we offer automated tools that make it so you're not picking and choosing. So I think it's important to give people the optionality. I think there's a real danger of picking intermediaries, be they banks who might have problems with liquidity as we've seen over the last two weeks or whether it's a fund manager like Blackstone itself. I mean, if Blackstone can't meet redemption requests, I don't know about whatever REIT you're investing in in some website, right? And I think the great virtue of being a direct investor is that you're repaid on the loan when we're repaid. When the borrower repays, you get it. And so if the market is locked up, yes, you're locked up. But if the market is not is flowing, but you know, there's no middleman to gate when you get your cash flow or your returns. And I think that kind of allowing people to have that kind of agency in private market investing as they do in public market investing is extremely important, right? Uh, and, and so we've stood for that all along. Now that said, of course, we're always looking at ways to make it faster and easier and, you know, more efficient to be a direct investor. And I think that's a place where technology can make a big difference. Got it. So let's follow this example through. So I've now looked at your offerings. I want to get some exposure to private credit, real estate, wine. Now, how do I figure out what's under the hood? So maybe like going to one of the questions for, submitted from the audience here, uh, Thomas said, uh, an alternative investor might understand the investment and feel good that it makes sense, but can, should, uh, and can should make more money. What do you see as the best way for an investor to become comfortable with the investment team itself? Webinars, Q and A calls, et cetera, are the normal ways. How do you personally present your investments to investor investors in order to promote confidence? I want to add on to that and just turn it around a little bit and say, what I as the investor, what should I be looking at? How do I diligence this? And even down to the level of, you know, two weeks ago, if I told you your money in a checking account may not be safe, you'd think you'd tell me I was crazy. Given that that's no longer the case, what do I look at for even the custody? Where is this stuff stored? Who, who, you know, who, who's checking the boxes? So how, how do I, as an investor, approach this whole piece of diligence, whether it's the team making the decisions, the underlying assets where they're stored, and other risks here once I've decided I want to commit to this? Why don't we start with uh, Brian on this one? I mean, for us, this is simple. Uh, we did the hard work back in you know, the early stages of the company. We took four years to build a regulatory foundation under Regulation A, we're fully disclosed with an offering circular on file with the SEC, and you can see everything about our company down to annually audited financials. Uh, and so that level of disclosure is extremely important. But then, you know, week to week, uh, month to month, we publish statistics uh, on our blog that give you uh, up to the up to the minute quantifications of our of our track record. Uh, and so it's very possible to know what our team has done uh, and how our team does it. So you can go to our offering circular. It's, you know, it's on file with the SEC. You don't have to take our word for it. Uh, we're under regulatory oversight there. And you can look to see exactly what we do and who does it. Uh, and then you can look on our blog for a ton of data uh, about how defaults perform and what's our loss ratio. Our loss ratio has always been about 30 to 50 basis points. Our net returns after that loss ratio has always been about 9.8 to about 10.2%. The average hold period or tenor has always been about 10 to 12 months. And you can look at how that changes in different seasons with different vintages and different periods. So 
that's how we approach it with you know regulatory outside oversight from the beginning at the highest level of rigor uh, to public company standards, and then supplemented by ongoing disclosure that's voluntary and on our on our blog. Um, we find that that uh, that meets most people's needs. Uh, and then of course we're out trying to do webinars and answer questions you know frequently too. But but th those are the two places that I would point people to to those kinds of resources. Nelson, how do you uh, advise investors to kick the tires on your offering and what tools do you provide to, to help that happen? Yeah, I think just even a general sentiment, uh, the concept of do your own research has never been more important, uh, especially in private markets as a whole. Private markets in general have consistently been more opaque than public markets, right? That makes sense. Uh, but the ability for technology companies like all of us here to be able to make things that much more transparent is critical, right? So being able to understand exactly what goes into each of these investments is really, really important. Now, for us in particular here at Percent, uh, we actually use the public debt markets as inspiration. And so for those who have invested in public debt instruments, you'll know that you know things are generally structured pretty similarly to one another. And you can say, this is an investment grade product because the rating agency said it was. This is a high yield product because the rating agency said it was. Uh, and so that concept of relative comparisons is possible. And because these are public companies, you have all their public filings as well, right? So you have their audited financials, you have all these different things that you can rely upon when making that investment decision. Now in private credit, that normally hasn't existed. And so what we've done on our side is to really make and bring a lot of that standardization to bear. So we have market standards, right? Every single deal has 52 different attributes that are published every single time uh, around how it was underwritten, what the credit enhancements were, what the asset details and modeling assumptions were, to be able to allow investors to really understand how and why it was structured priced a certain way. And then on top of that, uh, we have all the performance related to the underlying assets. And so you can actually see how it's done over time and whether the performance is commensurate with the risk that you're taking. So this is all kind of more legal and, and financial technology we're bringing to bear here just to make it all that much more transparent. And then from the investor standpoint, they can decide if that's the right fit for them. Every single deal we've ever done, good or bad, has been able to be viewed historically, right? All 400 plus deals. And so you can go back in time if you want to see it all, right? And we, we don't hide anything. Um, so you can make that judgment for yourself. And that's the most important thing. Uh, so do your own research uh, on our platform, on any other platform that you may be considering investing in. Um, and as much as there is a bit of a gut feel to private markets, that definitely was the case before when you invested off of a deck and just the feeling of the manager. These days, you never have had more tools at your disposal, and you should take advantage of them and use them. Got it. Anthony? I think Nelson makes a great point in that, um, you know, you take inspiration from more, more established uh, industries, and, and uh, with VinoVest, or regulated as an alcohol business, there's really a huge lack of standardization um, when you're looking at investment performance for wine. And every day we get questions about custody, right? We're actually storing real bottles of wine, cases of wine, casks of whiskey. Um, and with every single asset, um, we not only show our investor where it's stored, um, how we store it, how we inspect it for authenticity, for provenance, um, but we also realize that um, that's not enough. Um, you know, there's no FDIC insurance for wine, but We've been able to work with some great insurance providers to be able to provide that uh, top of the line, you know, over market value, really robust insurance policy to protect the line. Because, you know, one of the biggest risks with holding our asset is actually making sure that the asset uh, is, is staying in the right condition. So that custody piece is something that we've really honed in on. It's something that we've really tried to create new standards in the industry for and set self-regulator. Um, when there is no oversight. And I think that's helped a lot, especially as folks are, are very new to this space. Um, and we hope to continually be able to provide more transparency. Um, on the return side, we have public returns reports that we post on regular basis, just like Brian does on our blog. So that's something that we, we try to make available. And uh, with interacting with the team, we also have bi-weekly calls where any of our clients can hop on, uh, talk with our team, ask questions, not only about the product, about the portfolio performance. Um, so we really try to make ourselves accessible as well for any questions that pop up. So following on the diligence and kicking the tires on an investment, uh, Leticia asked a question about fees. So maybe just um, if you could all speak about the fees associated with your platforms. Also uh, for new investors, 
some of the tax implications that, that come with it. And, and may, maybe just answer broadly, again, from the perspective of the investor, what should I be looking for? Where are the hidden fees and gotchas that I need to watch out for? How do I you know, compare these alternatives um, with, with some framework where I can tell if, if these fees are reasonable, outrageous, normal, et cetera? Uh, why don't we start with Nelson on that one? Sure. So the historical fee structure as it pertains to investing in private credit through a fund is the usual two and 20 or 1.5 and 15 model, right? And that, what that means is basically you get paid, you get charged um, a 1.5 or 2% annualized fee off of the AUM, the investment amount that you give them. And then any upside above a certain percentage threshold that they set for themselves that you're comfortable with, they'll make anywhere from 15 to 20% of those gains, right? That is a conventional fund model. Uh, in percent instance, uh, in a direct deal, when you invest right now as an accredited investor, so that is one caveat, you have to be accredited on percent. Um, we don't actually charge anything at the moment. Uh, we are, we may consider doing that going forward, but as of right now, there is no fees to be charged on that side. If you invest in a managed product, by virtually the name itself, it is managed. Uh, there is some fees associated with that, but it's still not 1.5 and 20 or, or 15 or 2 and 20. It's actually just 1% of the AUM right, on an annual basis in total that we kind of net out every single month. Um, so pretty simple fee structure. I think in terms of to your question, Eric, around you know how to make sense of all the fees, if the fee structure is extremely complicated, I would probably be very suspect of the platform itself. It should be kept very simple for investors just to help them easily understand what they're investing into. Because if they're opaque and not transparent about the fees, that tells you a lot more about sort of how they run their business and what else may be going on under the hood when it comes to the investments themselves as well. Great. Anthony? So on, on our side, I'll, I'll go with the free structures on first the managed product and then our self-directed. On the managed side, uh, the, the main cost that we incur is the storage and insurance. So just like every single month, we do a prorated fee of an annualized between 1.7 and 2.25%. Depends on how much you invest. As you invest more with us, the fee scales down. Um, and we have on the trading side, an execution base fee. So based on any transaction that you do for the seller, it's 1% for the buyer, it's 2.5%. Got it. Brian? So uh, for us, we provide a grading scale that uh, gives you a, a quick assessment of risk, right? That's, that's important for the fees, 0% for, uh, for taxes. It's all on 11099 that you receive from us. So it's a 1099 INT. If you have a loss in your portfolio, you get a 1099B for each individual loss. Uh, so that's the tax reporting. Fees are zero. And uh, the, the grades give you a, a quick indication of risk. Great. Um, let's shift into just, again, the investor allocating their portfolio. So how do these investments work together, right? I've, I've decided I'm going to go outside my 60, 40 stocks and bonds and, and allocate 5% to alternatives. I like these offerings. How do I think about that portfolio construction? Do, do they uh, hedge one another? Do they balance one another? Is there additional risk on one another? And, and I'm not talking about your specific platforms, just you know, alternative investments in general. How would you approach that, uh, Anthony? Um, I, I could just give you my personal strategy. Um, I've been investing on Nelson's platform for a few years, Brian. I definitely want to try yours out now. Um, and when I look at alternatives, first is diversification, right? What's the correlation between those alternatives and what else is in my portfolio? Second is the risk-adjusted returns, right? If I'm invested in in crypto or other very volatile, very risky assets, I would want to balance that out with something that has lower volatility to be able to increase my overall risk-adjusted returns. And then thirdly, it would be the investment time horizon, right? How much, if I needed liquidity in a pinch, what percent of this non-alternative portfolio as well as the alternative portfolio is going to be liquid and available and ready? I think, you know, the expectation with alternatives is that inherently they are going to be less liquid, but wanting to plan that out and maybe ladder out the liquidity so that you can at least access a portion of it in the short term while saving most of it for the medium and long term. Nelson? Yeah, I think uh, to Anthony's point, uh, finding things that aren't correlated across your portfolio is super important. Uh, I think over the course of the next couple months, a year, year and change, 
finding things that are uncorrelated to the public markets is also going to be super important. Uh, there is, you know, when you looked at the inflation uh, numbers starting to print last year, um, the logical uh, logical move was to move into gold, right? And that actually did really well. That would have been a great trade, to be perfectly honest. Um, and so when you think about things that are a hedge against the public equity markets, that should be an approach that you think about here. And I can say probably all the platforms that we have here provide that opportunity to be uncorrelated, some assets less correlated than others, uh, and some sub-asset classes within each of these platforms less correlated than others as well. And so really it's just uh, between the risk appetite and the level of correlation to public markets, just keep that all in mind as you start to make uh, and construct that portfolio for yourself. Ryan, how do I blend all these interesting assets together? Uh, it, the way that I do, I mean, first of all, I I love investing in all these platforms. Uh, I, I invest in as many of them as I can, uh, as I could sort of tolerate my tax accountant will put up with. Um, and, and I'll tell you when I'm when I'm thinking about sizing my allocation, one of the the one of the great things about public markets is the liquidity, right? So if you want to sell out of your index fund or you want to sell out of your ETF or whatever you have or a stock, it's always easy to do that. Liquidity is always available to you. You may not like the terms of the liquidity and the price uh, if price is down. And I, I very much think about my alternative investments in terms of um, liquidity. So I, it's not that I won't invest in illiquid uh, assets like startups or longer duration credit or equity, I will, but I'm very careful when I do that to make sure that uh, I'm not compromising uh, the rest of my portfolio performance by liquidity. A lot of people don't know, uh, I spent some time early in my career in the regulated online gambling industry, and a lot of people don't know that the way casinos get you is not by the edge, you know, not by like the loss that you lose at the table. It's by something they call risk of ruin. And risk of ruin happens uh, two ways. One, when you don't bring enough money to the table, uh, so you can't weather normal variation at the casino. Uh, but secondly, you don't have enough liquidity to keep playing and you can't you can't get your money out. Uh, and, and so you're you're overly invested. Maybe in poker, you'd say you're pot committed. Uh, you know, this is a real problem in alternative investing because uh, liquidity can be can become very scarce. And that's especially true when public markets are down. So I think the number one question that I'm asking when allocating is, what's the liquidity? How do I tap it? What might that experience be like? And to the point that these guys are raising, how how what that what might that look like if public markets where most of the most the best liquidity is available, if public markets are suffering, you know how are how is this private alternative going to fare when I need that liquidity? And I I think. That's a non-obvious point. Uh, it's one that I've realized through my alternative investing journey over the last 10 years. I've been on the wrong side of liquidity and I've been on the right side of liquidity a lot of times. And, and I think that determines more of your results uh, across the portfolio than you might expect as a retail investor. Liquidity is a good entree to a topic that continues to come up in the Q&A. So let, let me ask if I'm going to read off a few questions from our audience and, and we'll try to string them together into responses uh and this involves crypto unsurprisingly which which was probably one of the first alternative assets that many of our audience had exposure to for better or for worse one uh, anonymous asks um what impact do you do you believe that a central centralized bank digital currency a cbdc will have on existing crypto investments another person asked uh what is your take on the risks on these investments to avoid the crypto scams that we suffered in the last two years? What are the key differences from your perspective? Want to make sure these investments platforms are not a type of crypto situation in the future. Uh, and a third question was around FTX. In light of what we saw with FTX, how does a retail investor have ins insurance that regulatory compliance and security issues have been addressed with alternative investments? So why don't we zoom out and just make it into a question, what's going on with crypto? What, what impacts that can have on the market and how, how do we avoid, um, you know, the kind of huge disappointment to investors we saw with, with, with an issue like FTX question was directed to me. So I'll just make a couple comments. One is that um, FTX was located outside of the U S the platforms we're talking about are within the U S so the regulatory compliance expectations that are in place, looking at Vinavest percent ground floor Coinbase, even 
um, were generally not there. So those protections weren't available. There was a lot of excitement about crypto. Uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, we all were there. Uh, we certainly have a lot of crypto in our portfolios. Uh, you have to you have to differentiate right scams, which is what somebody's asking about, from actual cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which may have a you know completely different role in the ecosystem. That, that's even um, having a good day today as we speak. Probably not due to this discussion, but maybe due to some of the Fed action. Uh, and lastly, the CBDCs, right? So the government is getting into the crypto business. Um, my belief there is that those those currencies, those CBDCs, would have a very clear role. Uh, perhaps some kind of a stable coin for government payments, distributions, some more efficiencies on moving money around. I do not believe that will interfere with the broader crypto market itself. Uh, but why don't we have everybody weigh in, uh, starting with Nelson. What are your thoughts on uh, where we're at on, on crypto and, and some of the other issues raised? Yeah, I think uh, crypto has proven itself to be fairly resilient, especially for some of those tier one asset classes that you had mentioned, right? Whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum or anything like that. Uh, I think just in general, there should be a lot of concern around um, anything else that's not really in that tier one category. Uh, they've proven themselves out to be the first ones to go and drop in that instance. Uh, I think in the same way that um, all of us here are selling securities in, in many different respects, uh, there is going to be regulation coming down to regulate a lot of these cryptocurrencies as securities. And in doing so, you're going to have a lot more consumer protections coming out of that, right? A lot of the reasons why these exchanges have gone down is because they weren't regulated in the United States and they were kind of doing whatever they wanted to do on their own. You look at the ones that have been able to weather the storm, it's because they are 100% regulated in the countries and economies that have rules and regulations in place and guardrails in place to protect investors. Um, so that is definitely coming. Um, there's no doubt about that. And I think if you're going to look to invest in, and diversify into things like crypto, uh, obviously, again, the message still holds true. Do your own research. Uh, but ultimately, um, the, the, the better bet would be on the ones that are either already regulated or the ones that have you know, fundamental um, importance to the value of the crypto ecosystem as a whole and do it on exchanges um, that are essentially regulated in the proper countries as well. Ryan, your latest thoughts on crypto? Uh, first of all, all I, I think the regulation of crypto will be a net positive. Uh, fully support uh, sort of Coinbase's stance here. I think that's, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the SEC has issued a Wells notice to Coinbase. They've gone through a very frustrating process. And I think everyone who has an interest in the crypto ecosystem uh, should be cheering them on. Uh, I think it's it's good to be regulated. It's good for regulation to be clear. We've seen what it's like to be at the bleeding edge of regulation. It's it's not easy. You have the statutes, you have the rules, which are the regulations, and then you have the people implementing them. And what you're seeing now is a lot of disagreement about uh, amongst the people about how to interpret the rules. And it's because we don't have a clear statute and a clear rule set to be applied. And so the human beings obviously are running amok. <laughs> and it's it's good for no one. Um, I, I am personally uh, very heavily invested in Bitcoin. I, I don't invest in any other cryptos. I, I think that one's unique and uh, I'm, I'm very long that specific asset. Uh, I, I do have a, uh, I, I do have some uh, knowledge about CBDCs. I think you know if you're a libertarian, you should be very concerned about what CBDCs can create. Uh, if you don't have those fears, uh, then, you probably view it as a net positive because the banking system might work more efficiently. There's there are prospects for that. And I think that's how the Fed and Treasury would kind of lead people to think. I mean, the Fed now uh, you know, program is set to, I guess, be introduced in July. So we'll see. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of activity and it's um I think for investing, I think you want to tread very carefully still. I think the industry has been through quite a watershed moment and continues to go through one that I, I think it comes out stronger and better on the other side. I don't think it's going away in particular. I know Bitcoin's not going away. Uh, that's my, that's my, that's not investment advice. It's just an opinion for entertainment value only. Uh, but, um, but that's, that's how I personally see it. Anthony. Yeah. I, I don't have too much to add on top of that, but I just will say, um, you know, with FTX's collapse, Celsius, Voyager, all of the others, right? It's really shaken consumer confidence, right? I think, you know, many of us listening uh, probably had some sort of exposure last year, some sort of loss. And I think that really sets, 
um, you know, the bar even higher for the remaining companies in crypto, right? How are they going to be able to show um, proper custody of the asset, right? Proper auditing of what what the leadership team is doing with with those customer assets that are being pooled or not pooled, right? And then I think the other thing is you know, hot cold storage, right? That's something that I think with uh, the ease of use of crypto. Um, user experience still has a long way to go before it can be fully mass adopted. I think that's why a lot of people lost their funds, um, you know, on exchange or in the hot wallets rather than having their own self custody. So I think those, those are things that will, will be changing for the better, you know, obviously a very, very painful experience for a lot of people last year. Um, but uh, to Brian's point and to Nelson's point, you know, crypto is here to stay. Uh, we'll be going through this painful period, more regulation, more standards, but that's a good thing. I also want to say, Eric, like people forget, you know, uh, brokerage investing itself in public markets was only deregulated in the 70s. Uh, you know, 1974 is when commissions were deregulated. It took a full 10 years for uh, the full benefit of that to reach retail investors at scale during the 1980s bull market. And, you know, 20 years before we got, or 30 years before we got commission-free trades overall, right? So these changes from law to regulation to implementation and commercialization can take very long cycles. And I realize that all of us have short attention spans and want things to happen faster, but they do take some time. And when they matter in finance, they take even more time. So um, I think patience uh, will be rewarded you know, in these, in these markets. I agree. You have to take a long-term view on this. The, the bar for regulatory compliance custody is going up, especially in the U.S. That's going to drive a lot of innovation to other places, um, but you, you have to be in it for the long haul. And it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years. We're approaching the end of this discussion. So let, let's finish with one last question. Um, there's a number of unanswered questions in, in the chat, which we'll try to make sure that we cover on websites or, or in subsequent follow-ups. But Let's just leave the audience with one thought for the future, either a question that you wish someone asked, but they didn't, a new product development on your horizon that you're super pumped about, or some expectation or hope of, of where this macro picture is going to go that, that could help a lot of our investors with, with an insight. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Anthony on that one? Yeah, I, I think it's just incredible being able to see the optionality available for retail investors today. Right. I think, especially since COVID, that has just accelerated at, at extreme paces. So I think for the retail investor, especially with, um, you know, that, that optionality, it, it's hard to choose, right? And, you know, Brian, I'm like you and wanting to test everything out. Um, and and that's, that's also something that, um, you know, figuring out what you like, testing out with small amounts, right? And, and with alternatives, a lot of them are going to be uncorrelated. A lot of them are going to give you those returns. But I think uh, another part about it is like what really speaks to you, right? Why do why there's just an explosion in angel investment when statistically it is is probably one of the worst things that you can be doing with your money, right? There's there's that other sort of intangible aspect of connecting with the founder, of supporting somebody's dream becoming true, of creating, you know, being part of creating jobs. And to me, that's that's another really exciting about part of alternatives is there's that sort of lifestyle, you know, benefit, right. And in, in being able to say that, and I think, you know, people's, um, investments have really become social currency as well. People are saying, Hey, I'm a, I'm a Tesla investor, right. That is like part of their identity, certainly with the crypto world, right. We see people with laser eyeballs on, on Twitter and all that. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's some, just an interesting observation. I think a trend, uh, here to stay as well for investors into alternatives is they're they're also going to be leading with what really fits you know their their character and, and and their mindset as well great point definitely seeing that evolve brian uh how would you respond yeah i you know i've been reflecting a lot lately because our company turned 10 years old uh in february 10 years since we were founded Happy uh, and about at, through poetic justice we also crossed over a billion dollars invested on the platform by retail investors. That's not including the institutional investors who've invested alongside them or when we traded loans to Blackstone before COVID, uh, none of that. Um, and yet, as I reflect on it as a founder who's excited about this industry, I think it's still early 
you know, uh, billion dollars invested, 300 million assets under management, 10 years. And yet I still see so much opportunity in real estate alone, let alone the other categories that Nelson's talking about, that Anthony's talking about. Uh, I, I personally angel invest in this sector. So I put my money where, where my mouth is. I, I really enjoy backing founders uh, in this space because I, I just believe in it. I believe in it for all kinds of reasons. I just, the reason we started the company is because we felt like retail investors not only deserve their fair share of the pie, they deserve to be served the same thing uh, as institutions and wealthy individuals in the United States. And I think that's happening. And I think that's super exciting, but we're, I mean, dude, we're in the second inning you know, uh, of, of what I hope is a long and exciting world baseball classic caliber uh, game, you know, uh, and I, I'm, I, I feel privileged to be part of it. So I, I think there's a lot of, with our company and with the other companies here and in the industry generally, I think retail investors have a lot to look forward to with the maturation of these platforms and um and as they sort of start to achieve their vision you know at a greater level of scale i just think it's good stuff coming i'm really enjoying the trends you're you're pointing out both of you i mean the, this thing of alternative asset investing for me has also been uh very enriching challenging frustrating rewarding lots of relationships and meaning and identity come from that uh, and like most of you, probably all of you, I'm way overexposed to the sector. So, so my hope for the coming year is that we we get a soft landing, right? We're we're in some sense paying the dues from the last couple of years of excitement and and over, you know, activity. In in the coming year, hopefully, we can thread the needle and and get back to a to a more sane point in in all these markets without much more value destruction. Last word, uh, Mr. Nelson. Sure. So I think uh, the one thing that we can all probably predict in the next year is that it's going to be unpredictable. Uh, and I think the the reality is, you know, we had a very much up into the right economy for a very long time, and that's now no longer the case. Uh, but in times of, of volatility and times of uncertainty, uh, that is where most of the money is made. You look at historically, uh, those who are liquid uh, during times of crisis have done very, very well for themselves. There are things that are mispriced on a regular basis these days for whatever reason it may be, whether it's a equity on the private side in an in a angel investment, right? Uh, or it could be something on the debt side because there's opportunistic deals that are coming to market. Um, this is the time where I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't recommend exactly going on the offensive directly, uh, but at the very least, it is time to be opportunistic and take a look at what's out there. And if you have a good sense of what's going on in the general landscape and you have a thesis, um, then I think many of the investors on this call uh, can do very well for themselves by being able to find those diamonds in the rough that are most certainly out there. And there's gonna be even more of them in the coming months ahead uh, as the volatility continues to, to increase and, and expand from where it is today. Great last comment. Uh, so we're at the, we're at the end of the hour here. So let's thank everybody. Thank the panelists for participating. It was a really insightful, open discussion. Thank you to everybody who made time for this. A lot of you took time out of your day and we appreciate you. And happy investing to everybody in 2023. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, guys.